All right. So good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. For those of you joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And this is our last program of October, needless to say. I think since September 12th, we're on like 79 or 80 programs already. So it's been a really wild and crazy time. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, everything lives there. So you can check out these programs in three weeks, in three years. You can check out things on any other topic imaginable. 3,000 programs there. A lot of fun to be had. Now today, before we dive in with our topic, the special topic for Halloween today, I will note we do have a Kahoot together. And we've got some great 11, so you guys might like kill at this. But four quick questions between our talk and our Q&A. If you want to play along, be a little extra interactive, Kahoot.it, the game pin there. They're always a lot of fun, and I will feature that before we go live with it in about 25 minutes as well. Now, today I am thrilled because we are welcoming back our friends at OceanWise. OceanWise is the leading ocean conservation education organization in the world, whether it's marine plastic, sustainable seafood, the amazing creatures of the deep. OceanWise really does it all. Uh, everything they have is at ocean.org, so so much more to discover there. But today, of course, in honor of Halloween, we're doing our second freaky broadcast yesterday. We went and hung out with the Paris Catacombs, the city of the dead underneath Paris, which is really cool. So today we wanted to follow up on this special day with what's lurking in the deep, the weird and wonderful creatures of the deep sea. It is the biggest habitat on Earth. There's a lot of really freaky things down there that live nowhere else on Earth and have no real relation to anything else that's living anywhere else. So we're going to turn you over to Mala to blow your mind to some of those amazing stories. Uh, and without further ado, Mala, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the broadcast for the first time. Hi, Jesse. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and talk to you all about my favorite ecosystem, honestly, in the ocean, which is the deep sea for a lot of the reasons you listed. Um, there's just so many weird and creepy animals down there that you probably won't come across anywhere else. And I'm super excited to introduce you to some of them. But before we do, I think it's really, really important that we do a quick land acknowledgement, just acknowledging the land that I'm coming to you all from today. And I'll introduce who I am and the organization uh, that I work for as well. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. Yes, we okay. sure can. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So as Jesse mentioned, I am actually from Toronto, Ontario. And this is the traditional territory of many different nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat people. Uh, this land is also home to many diverse First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis people. And I just want to honor this land and extend my thanks to the communities who have been here taking care of the land, sea, and the sky since time immemorial. Uh, one thing that I absolutely love about my job is that I get to connect with people all over the world. And I know a lot of you are tuning in from different parts of North America as well, which is super exciting. And today is really, really special because I get to talk about my favorite part of the ocean, which is the deep sea. Um, I'm going to need a lot of participation today. So I'm sure Jesse will help me out when it comes to calling on you to answer some questions. And I know you all might have some amazing questions as well. So don't be shy. Feel free to ask us any questions that you may have as well. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about OceanWise in case you're not familiar with us. We are an ocean conservation group, and we are based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. And we are trying to address three major issues that the ocean is facing today that you are all probably a little familiar with, uh, which include ocean pollution, overfishing, and climate change. Um, as I mentioned, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these issues today, and the deep sea is also actually affected uh, by these problems as well. I know sometimes we might think, the deep sea is so far away. How do we as people have an impact on it? So while we're going through today's program, I want everybody to think about the different ways that we might influence the deep sea as well. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to know when I mention the deep sea, what animals come to mind? Does anybody have any animals that they want to share with me? What cool deep sea animals do you know about? All right. I'm going to assume our grade 11s will only be shared in the chat. So feel free to type in there, Bishop Allen, if you guys would like to. Um, but Grisham Middle School, Austin, if you guys want to kick us off, any deep sea creatures that jump to mind? What do we think? Um, like a sunfish. Sunfish? Okay. 
A very weird. Oh, no one knows sunfish. That's very cool. Um, Michelle Abarger's class, Iowa. What do you guys think? Yeah, what do you think, Lennon? Well, I think marine worms. Marine, marine worms? worms. Guys are the coolest kids ever. How do you even know these things? This is so weird. We got giant squid and lanternfish coming in on YouTube. Um, Miss Markle's class, I'm going to come to you guys really quick. What do we think? One more. Well, yeah. everyone get turned right. Vampire squid. Vampire squid. Vampire squid. Oh my. Mala, we didn't need to do the program, I don't think. These kids know everything. It's very exciting. Apparently, we have some deep sea experts here, which is absolutely incredible. I want everybody to think about the animals that we just listed. Maybe we might talk about a couple of them today. Uh, but my friends, before we jump in and we really start interacting with these animals, I want everybody to um, think about the different ways that we impact the deep sea as I mentioned, think about those really cool animals and what it takes to survive. How are animals in the deep sea surviving? Um, it's really, really unique ecosystem down there, right? When we think about coral reefs and we think about um, you know, kelp forests and different things like that, those conditions are very different from the ones in the deep sea. So does anybody know of any problems or issues, um, challenges that deep sea animals might be facing uh, and how they might survive? Any challenges? Yeah. So Mr. Hancock's class, I'm going to Georgetown. Any challenges in the deep sea? Weird oh, things yeah, down there like. that might be different from elsewhere. Uh, we're thinking pollution. Even though they're deep down, it could still affect them. Okay, very cool. Miss Smith, Miss 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 Smith's class. My English is really rough today. I don't know. Too much chocolate. Uh, third graders, what do you guys think? Explosions. Yeah. Dynamite fishing. Dynamite, Dynamite fishing. Dynamite fishing. Who are all you kids today with these answers? You guys know everything. Um, we've got darkness coming in on our chat. Darkness, cold. So a few of the habitat things. Some of the challenges in terms of fishing. Um, Pollution, a little big group of options, plastic coming in. Amazing. These are all incredible challenges. Um, some of you are already ocean experts. Uh, you might have to come to me and do an interview because maybe y'all can work with us too. Um, amazing answers coming in, my friends. You all mentioned uh, pollution. You mentioned plastic. You mentioned explosions. But a lot of them are environmental issues. So things that are taking place in their ecosystem that might be affecting them. Uh, today, I want to introduce you all to our own ocean exploration vessel. We are going to be riding on our own deep sea vessel and interacting with the deep sea to take a look at what exactly is going on down there, collecting data as scientists ourselves. So let me introduce everybody to the deep sea program. Um, we have an alert. We have a special message from OceanWise. Let's see what they want to tell us. <laughs> so hello and welcome aboard everybody, the OceanWise Deep Sea Explorations Vessel. Your task is to take down the ROV to each oceanic zone and collect data. Make sure that you report back your findings and your deep sea adventure begins now. Amazing. So we have our own ROV today that we are going to be taking down to collect some really cool data. What is an ROV exactly? My friends, an ROV is a remote operated vehicle. It's essentially like a remote control car that scientists send down into the bottoms of the ocean to where no human has ever been. And it collects data, it collects sound, video, it has a flashlight so that it can see everything. And it captures a lot of the data that scientists use to do research in the deep sea because it's really hard for us to go down there ourselves. So let's send our exploration vehicle down and see what data it could potentially collect for us today. As I mentioned, we are going to be going through different oceanic zones, and we are going to start off in the uppermost zone, the zone that we know the most about, which is the sunlight zone. My friends, the sunlight zone is zero to 200 meters deep, this is where we see a bunch of animals that we are really, really familiar with. Maybe this is where you go scuba diving, snorkeling, surfing to the beach, fishing, things like that. And a really cool thing about the sunlight zone is that there's a lot of plants that grow there and there's a lot of beautiful, colorful life, like in the coral reefs. Uh, you can see a 
lot of different animals that live in these ecosystems like sea turtles and beautiful colorful fish coral reefs are kind of like um the you know like the rainforests of the ocean and a lot of animals here like to eat plants um and these plants grow the same way plants on land grow and that is through photosynthesis but my friends do we think plants grow in the deep sea what do we think mm. and if they don't grow in the deep sea what do we think animals in the deep sea might eat instead of plants Ooh, or i mean at this point since they've got dynamite fishing and deep sea worms they probably know all these answers but uh let's see grisham middle school Plants in the deep sea? Yes, no? What do we think? Yes, yes. 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 Bit of a mix. Okay, if they're if they are if they aren't there, what do they eat? What do we think? Like okay. I like these answers. These are good. Shallow burger, what do you guys think? I come to you. Iowa. <laughs> we've reached the cacophony section. Uh, <laughs> on YouTube, we've got we got uh things in deep sea vents. We've got that written in. That's interesting. Okay. We've got a lot of no's for plants on the bottom. So there's been a few yeses, but overwhelmingly no. Um tiny microbes and chemosynthesis coming in on YouTube. Oh my gosh, huge words today. I'm going to have to do some research after today's program to learn from you all. Amazing, my friends. There are so many answers. Um, you know, there's something really weird in the deep sea, and I want everybody to show a thumbs up in their classrooms or a thumbs down if you've ever heard of something called marine snow. Just show us some mm. thumbs up, thumbs downs in your classrooms, wherever you are, if you've ever heard of a lot of a lot of thumbs down over wow okay in direct contrast to everything else it's like overwhelming thumbs down with like a few thumbs up mala okay amazing so let's take a look at what marine snow is first i'm going to show you what marine snow looks like then i'll explain exactly what it is so what is marine snow All right, so if everybody can kind of see these little white flakes that are kind of drifting in the ocean, it kind of looks like snow. This is what we call marine snow, and it's not exactly snow. It's actually a bunch of food crumbs that are drifting down from the bottom along with um, the poop of other animals. So it's the poop of animals and the leftovers of animals all getting clumped together, making these little flakes and then drifting down to the bottom of the ocean where a bunch of smaller animals can gobble it up and eat it up. Um, I don't know about you. I personally don't want to eat fish poop, but unfortunately, some animals have to eat that. That's just an adaptation that they have in order to survive. So you gotta do what you gotta do to survive. <laughs> My friends, there's another really big source of food for animals in the deep sea, and it's something called whale fall. Can you all show me thumbs up and thumbs down again if you've ever heard of something called whale fall before? Mm. Oh, a lot of yeses. Oh, uh, it's half and half, I would say, spread amongst the classes. That's interesting. You're in for such a treat, by the way. Whale falls are the coolest thing ever. I'm going to leave it to Mal to tell you all about it. But it's so, so cool. Okay. They really are. So, my friends, whale fall, I will show you exactly what it is. Whale fall is what happens to a whale or a large animal after it passes away. Now, sometimes whale fall, when I originally learned about it, I thought it was pretty sad. But the more I thought about it, the more I learned about it, the more I thought how beautiful life cycles in our oceans and on our planet planets really are. So whale fall is when a whale eventually dies, it will sink down to the bottom of the ocean. Once the whale falls down to the bottom of the ocean, other animals will come in and then they will eat this animal. And I know it seems a little bit scary. Um, it might be a little bit um, sad and a little neat, but my friends, 
I want us all to think about how important this one whale might be to hundreds of animals that are living down in the deepest parts of the ocean. Even after passing away, this whale will serve such a big purpose to all these other animals that are down there. And all these animals will have their belly full and be able to continue to survive. So these animals will eat up every single part of this whale and make sure nothing goes to waste. I actually have a really cool video here that I want to show us of whale fall. So we're going to take a look at whale wow. fall in the deep sea. Oh. Oh. Whale, whale fall. fall. Oh. Oh. Whale fall. Oh. 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 Here we go, oh. baby. Okay, yes. Kimmy is phenomenal. We can't stop, can we? We, we can stop and come back if you want. Yeah. I think. Oh, uh, my God. Let's yeah. take our time with it, and then we, I think we it's have worth to come it. back anyway. Yeah. So. Video. Oh, that oh is my God. Okay. So, so, I can't hear you. so that's pretty cool. Let me just explain what we're looking at here. This is a baleen whale that has sunk down to the bottom of the ocean, and we can see so many different animals coming in in a food frenzy to eat this whale up and help them survive. Everything from small little worms to octopus to sharks to fish are all coming together to eat up this whale and make sure no last piece is left. Nothing goes to waste. And that is something that I want us all to keep in mind when it comes to how we might be affecting our oceans. Unfortunately, there's a lot of waste these days, but people and these animals in the deep sea actually have something in common, and that is trying not to waste food. Indigenous communities in specific, when they used to hunt whales, they would use up every single part of the whale, making making sure no part went to waste because they wanted to respect the oceans and respect the whale. So this is something that maybe we can all adopt as well. If we're going to have some food, if we're going to buy things, that is totally fine. But let's make sure that we try our best to make sure that there is no waste or at least minimal waste. Oh, amazing. So my friends, that was the shallow part of the sea. We looked at the at the sunlight zone. Now it's time to go a little bit deeper and maybe address another challenge of the deep sea. So we are gonna go a little bit deeper into the twilight zone around 200 to 1000 meters deep. Here's where it starts getting a little bit darker. Uh, so we're gonna have to turn on our flashlight to make sure that we can see things. And maybe um, it might start getting a little bit heavier down there. There might be a little bit more pressure. Oh, speaking of pressure, it looks like we already ran into a trap uh, challenge. Maybe we might have a problem. Let's see what's going on on our little exploration vessel here. It looks like pressure levels are too high, so we have to secure our pressure chamber in order to continue. And it looks like our pressure chamber is secured, so we can continue going into the deepest part of the ocean. Our ROV also captured an image. Let's open this and see who we ran into. We have our first deep sea animal that we are gonna be taking a look at. Who knows what this animal is? Maybe we have some answers in the chat or somebody wants to yell it out for us. I'm gonna to head to uh, Miss Markle's class. Does anyone know what this is? Bonefish. Bonefish. Bonefish, really interesting pick. I like that. Mr. Hancock, what do you guys think? Do you have a thought for us? A blobfish. What kind of fish? A blobfish. A blobfish. I wondered if you were going to meet this friend today. Mala, is, are either of those right? What do we think? <laughs> you got it. It is a blobfish, my friends. This is a blobfish. Super, super cute guy. Uh, but it was actually voted as one of the ugliest animals on our planet. And that is because, unfortunately, when you take this guy out of water, this is what he ends up looking like. So he kind of melts all over the table and his eyes start to fall out of his face. And he looks very much like today's theme, which is the spooky deep sea. My friends, this is because of pressure. There is so much pressure in the deep sea that is coming in from every single side, side from the left, from the right, from the top and the bottom, and it's compressing everything. We as humans who live on land, we have our skeleton. We have bones that help us keep our shape. But animals in the deep sea, they've actually adapted their bodies. And a lot of their bodies are going to be super jelly-like. And that's because the pressure will help them 
keep shape. In fact, there's so much pressure down there that we actually ran an experiment. We took a styrofoam cup and we decorated it, sent it around 2,000 meters deep, 2,000 feet deep, sorry. And when it came back, it was all shriveled up. That's how deep it can get, or sorry, that was how much pressure there can be uh, in the deep sea. And that's just another adaptation that animals have, um, which is their jelly-like body to help them keep shape. Um, now, I've mentioned the word adaptation a couple of times, but does anybody actually know what an adaptation is? Can anybody define to me what an adaptation is? Ooh, oh, Shellabarger's class. You guys had hands uh, jump up there. So we'll head to Iowa. What do you guys think? Yeah. Caleb, what do you think? To, like evolve to your surroundings. Evolved to your surroundings. Okay. So did we get an adaptation? Very, very cool. We got another hand up. Go for it. Yeah. Augie? I forgot the word. Oh, good, guys. That's fantastic. That's okay. Cool. Mal, that was cool. Yeah. No, I mean, they pretty much hit the nail on the head with the first yeah. answer there. It's any sort of characteristics or anything that's going to help an animal survive in their uh, natural environment. So that can be the way their mouth is shaped, how many eyeballs they have, the types of arms and legs that they have. And in the deep sea, we have some animals with some incredible adaptations, not just body adaptations, but the way they eat, uh, the sounds that they make, um, the different things that they might produce from their bodies. So as I talk about what we produce or what these animals in the deep sea produce, I think it's time to go in to the deepest part of the ocean now, um, into the darkest parts uh, that we've explored, which is gonna be the midnight zone. Uh, so let's hop in to the midnight zone. My friends, this is gonna be 1,000 to 4,000 meters deep, and we are definitely going to be running in to some really cool adaptations. In specific, one of my favorite ones, um, and one that is seen as a phenomenon around the room or around the world, which is bioluminescence. And if anybody knows what bioluminescence is, maybe you can whisper it in the ear of somebody beside you. Or if you have a chat, you can message us and let us know what bioluminescence is. But we're going to take a look and explore exactly what bioluminescence looks like and what types of animals might have it. So we have a really cool radar here. and We're picking up three different heartbeats in the deep sea. Let's see what three animals we run into today. Let's shine our light around and see who we run into first. We have our first animal here. Who are we looking at? Does anybody know what this animal is? Do we want to right. share? Share. You can chime in in the chat. I'm going to leave the chat for this one. I want to make sure we get a nice long Kahoot and Q&A, so just write it as quick as possible. This is a very common one. This is one of my favorite creatures in the deep sea that may or may not feature in our Kahoot. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, oh, uh, anglerfish coming in on YouTube. Yes, I think that might be correct, Mala. <laughs> this is an anglerfish, my friends. Anglerfish are known for that lure on top of their head that attract prey, that attract their food. Really popular. They got their fame from Finding Nemo. Maybe you might recognize them from. And they're really, really cool. Another animal that we have in the deep sea is this guy over here and they have a really cool adaptation this over here is a sea cucumber my friends and one thing that we might notice is that they're very red or pinkish and that is because a lot of animals in the deep sea will be red and it'll be because red is actually invisible in the deep sea so animals have adapted their skin color to turn red so that they kind of disappear in the deep sea and these guys are really really cool they like to drift around in the darkness of the ocean. And we have one last animal here that we are gonna run into. It is a type of jellyfish. This is actually a coronet medusa called the Atola jellyfish. This guy's called a coronet medusa because it has a nice crown-like shape on top of its head. And this jellyfish is actually mm -hmm. called um, an alarm jellyfish because it actually flashes blue lights in the deep sea to catch the attention of their prey or to alarm any of their predators and get them to go away and to leave them alone. Don't mess with me. Um, so they have the name, the alarm jellyfish. 
So my friends, before I end off here, we get into the Kahoot and we get into the Q&A. Um, I told us all to think about how we as humans might impact the deep sea. And now I want to hear your thoughts. How do we think that we are impacting the deep sea? What role do we have to play in the deep sea um, and the health of the deep sea? Yeah, so we already got some fantastic answers to this earlier on when we were doing a different Q&A period. Uh, on YouTube, uh, Cookie in Vancouver, Miss Kurt's class, if you guys want to chime in too. I'm going to head to Miss Smith's class, third graders. If you want to answer, how do you think we impact the deep sea? We'd love to have you uh, chime in. You can unmute your mic and go for it. What do we think, Austin? Right, what do you think? Um, I think that, uh, okay, Oakley. Okay. Um, I think that, um, how do we impact the DC? Oh, um, um, we can, um, impact the DC, um, the deep sea by, like, um, by, um, saving more animals there. That's okay, guys. We can always come back in a minute, too, but this is a good start. Uh, Shella Barger class, you got a bunch of hands up there. I'll head to you guys. Do you have any thoughts for us, fifth graders? Uh, but over hunting the upper sea, because a lot of food comes from the upper sea. Amazing. I know earlier we had pollution, too. Uh, using and creating pollution is coming in on YouTube as well. Uh, Mr. Hancock, we'll do one more quick with you guys. What do we think? Yeah, we were just saying that if there's no more whales, and they're not falling down, and then they don't have anything to eat as well, yeah. Fantastic. Mal, we got good answers here. These are fantastic from our classes as always. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing answers. In fact, the whale one in specific and the fishing one that we mentioned are really, really big um, things to think about. My friends, we are doing two major things that are affecting our oceans. Uh, one of them is overfishing, which is catching way too many fish, um, catching way too many animals from the top. Um, and that's messing up the cycle. It's messing up the food chain. And the second thing is plastic pollution. A lot of our plastic is being found in some of the deepest parts of the ocean where no human has ever been. Um, if we think about it, every single piece of plastic that we have produced since the beginning of plastic production is still on our planet because plastic doesn't break down, it doesn't decompose. And all that plastic is ending up in our oceans eventually and it's finding our, its way into some of the deepest parts of the ocean as well. So we got to make sure that we're finding solutions to both overfishing and plastic pollution if we want to help with the deep sea issue. Um, there's also something called bycatch, maybe something that we aren't all familiar with. And that is when animals are caught by mistake in these giant fishing nets. And unfortunately, a lot of animals are caught by mistake as bycatch and a lot of deep sea animals because those big nets drag through the ocean floor and kind of catch anything that comes in their way. So a lot of these animals are being caught by mistake as well. But we at OceanWise want to make sure that we are helping provide solutions and coming up with ways that we can protect our oceans and continue doing work to make sure that we're restoring the oceans as well. One thing that you can do is buy sustainable seafood. So if you ever go to your local store or to your local fish market, anything like that, and you're buying seafood, you can keep an eye out for the OceanWise recommended logo. That means that our seafood team has already done the work and we have deemed that this fish is already sustainable. So maybe buying this one might be a healthier choice for you and also for our oceans. Uh, that's all I have today with the deep sea. I hope you all learned something new and something creative. Um, I had so much fun talking to you all about the deep sea. Yeah, right. Um, I had a fun QR code there and you guys can scan it if you'd like and figure out what ocean animal you are. But I hope you all learned something new today. I had a blast talking to you all about it. <laughs> so, so much fun, Mala. Uh, again, we've done dozens of programs with OceanWise. I've never had Mala on this. It's a real pleasure. So a big thank you to you, the OceanWise team. This is so much fun. Uh, we are going to dive in with our Kahoot. So four quick questions. Test your understanding. Have a little bit of fun. If you're new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And if you want to just play along by answering in your class, that's totally fine. You don't win anything, but you do win Mal and I's everlasting respect, which is pretty cool. So uh, we're going to give you guys a second to start with this. 
I want to note too, this is shameless, but uh, we got Bishop Allen here today and I'm a Martin Grove collegiate boy and everything our school did when I was there, Bishop Allen beat us at. So I'm kind of jaded against you, but I like you because it's my job. Uh, but nice to have you guys in no matter what. Uh, 34 of you in so far, keep them coming. We'd love to have more in. Uh, we're going to get underway in just a second and then we're going to do Q&A. So Grisham Middle School, I'm coming to you guys first, Miss Hans's class. We got a whole bunch of Austin today, Iowa, Ontario and more YouTube you guys have been amazingly interactive so please do keep uh it going with the kahoot and the questions but let's get underway with our first question and mal if you want to give them a hint when there's like five seconds to go in each of these you are welcome to chime in with me all right by the way we have a permanent big kahoot with ocean wise as well on our kahoot page if you're keen to follow up with even more but all right how deep is the deepest point of the ocean this is vaguely hinted at on the side in our midnight zone but 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, or over 30,000 feet. Some of our kids might know this outright. You guys were like the most on the ball classes I think I've ever seen in 1500 broadcasts. So you're amazingly on it today. Uh, 50 answers so far. What's our answer? It is. Ooh, we tripped up a few people. So over 30,000 feet. The deepest point of the ocean is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. And a shockingly small number of people have been there. Only two people had gone. Till like 2012 then james cameron the director went which is wild and then now there's been like a few other expeditions that have taken people down but i still think it's close number of people that have been on the moon and number of people that have been to the mariana trench so it's very very deep uh witty lemming is in our lead oh tied with super deer that doesn't happen very often fast you answer more points folks what percentage of the world's livable space so places that animals can live we did not cover this explicitly but I will note that my questions tend to have a trend associated with them. Is it 5%, 25%, 75%, or over 99% of the livable space, places where animals can live on this planet? Now think, the land you, you, the land is flat. The air is a little bit. There's a lot of ocean out there, and it's already 70% of the world. Only nine of you got this. It is over 99% of the world's livable space is in the ocean, which is wild. We Every time we bring in deep-sea biologists, we like to highlight this, and uh, it is very, very cool. Screws up our leaderboard entirely. It's fun for me, though. All right, Mala, question three. My favorite one that I had fun making. Um, let's see. Classic. <laughs> yeah. And what on earth is this? Halloween decoration, movie prop, actual fish, living nightmare. I mean, I should give you bonus points if you pick D, but it's not D, just so you know. Now, we talked about this specifically. I'm so glad you incorporated this talk. This is the anglerfish. We didn't get to talk about this, but I'm going to take a second to share. That's a female anglerfish. Every anglerfish you've ever seen is a female. It's one of the freakiest things in nature. You ready? So the males are really, really tiny. They swim up, they bite the female, and then they get like absorbed into her body. So a female will be swimming around to all these little like nodules that just like sort of hanging off her. And those are all little males that like got absorbed into her. It's one of the freakiest things in nature. And now you know, now it is a living nightmare for you. If, course, if I can actually jump in, sure. the anglerfish Please. is actually only the size of your fist. A female anglerfish yeah. will average be the size of your fist and the male will be around 10 times smaller. Yep, they are. Um, it's funny. I always thought they were quite big until I finally saw that. It was really <laughs> freaky to me. Like they're tiny fish, but they're so so cool. All right. Sure. Final question: True or false? In the depths, a huge number of creatures emit light and bioluminesce. We talked about this a little bit. Um, I just want to drive this point home. I think it's one of the coolest things in nature. The picture might give it away, but there you go. We'll screw the leaderboard. Bioluminescence is amazing. We had a deep sea biologist on a few months ago, and she talked about the fact that if you really think about it, since most of the world's habitat is deep ocean, more things, more kinds of things bioluminesce than you sight or smell or sound or anything else. So it's actually a really common way that animals communicate, which is really freaky, because on land, we don't see it very much. Maybe some of you have seen fireflies. Um, that's the only animal I've ever seen that bioluminesces. So very, very cool. Super deer third, caring emu is second. And first place for all the marbles please let us know if you are any of these people fuzzy hawk way to go uh we're gonna stop sharing there and we're gonna dive in with as quick and as awesome a q a as we can muster i know some of you have to go soon in fact um yeah grisha middle school we'll head to you first we're gonna try and do everyone in our first round uh, bishop allen if you guys want to share on camera you're welcome to i know sometimes grade 11s uh you might want to share in the chat either way is totally fine i will come in person in a few but this hands welcome yeah. you guys 
Ooh, no one's ever been there. How do we know how big? <laughs> so anglerfish can actually live in different zones of the ocean. So for example, if we go to Southeast Asia, they might live a little bit higher up in the ocean than in other parts. So depending on that, I also mentioned bycatch. A lot of animals get caught by mistake. Um, sometimes we can go in there and actually use machines to catch fish to do our research. So we have um, recorded footage of these animals um, and things like that that we've followed along for a while. Uh, yeah. Great question. <laughs> No, all comes down to the, research. Worth noting, like, I mean, we have a hard time getting there. It's still very difficult to explore the deep sea, but we do go there. There are several major research submersibles. We actually had them on this program, which is really fun, that go down and explore and see things like anglerfish in the natural habitat, which is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, this, oh, go ahead, Mal. I would recommend if you're interested in scientists going into the deep and seeing footage and things like that, maybe you can check out uh, the EV Nautilus. Uh, they're always sending their submarine down and collecting super cool footage on deep sea animals. Um, so they're a really cool way to learn about more animals that live down there. It's on our website right now. We've got a program with the RV Falcor, which also has deep sea submersibles, which is coming up like next week. And we have very few signups for us. If anyone wants to follow this up with a really cool program, and that's amazing. We've had the Nautilus on many times. I've got a YouTube channel for you all too. That's going to blow your minds. <laughs> uh, Miss Smith's class, third graders, we're heading to you guys. Keeping it going with Austin. Hey guys, uh, you're good to go. Hey, just unmute. <laughs> Hi, do we have any questions for Mala? No questions? Not really. Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? Um, well, like, when you do dynamite fishing, like, is there any deep sea fishing that do it? I think this is, is any deep sea creature affected by dynamite fishing? Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah, for sure. If you can imagine dropping bombs into the ocean and it kind of destroying entire ecosystems, right? All of that debris is going to fall down. It might also hurt a lot of different animals. Um, the ocean is sensitive, right? Any sort of changes that might take place on any level um, can really impact oceans all around the world, whether it's climate, whether it's temperature, um, whether it's the structure of the ocean as well. So it's really important that if we are going to be fishing, which obviously we have to, um, 3 billion people rely on seafood as their primary source of food, right? Obviously we can't get rid of that. Um, but it's important to find ways that are less invasive, meaning finding methods that don't cause too much of an impact on especially the ecosystem uh, that the animals are living in, for sure. Good question, guys. All right. I'm at Shella Barger's class, fifth graders. I'm heading to you, Miss Markle, Mr. Hancock, Bishop Allen. You're sharing in the chat. That's awesome. Uh, we're taking everyone, I promise. And then Miss Kirk on YouTube in two in a minute. Uh, but welcome in, guys. Uh, fifth graders, take us away. What's the coolest thing you've ever seen from a submarine? And then what's the what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen from a uh, submarine? <laughs> Man, okay. So I have never been in a submarine. It would be a dream come true. But yeah. from footage that I've seen, um, I think jellyfish are like the coolest things ever. Um, there's so many different kinds of them. They've been around since the dinosaurs. Like they've lived for so long and they've overcome so many changes that our earth has gone through. So I think they're one of the most incredible animals ever. And one of the weirdest ones, honestly, I would say say probably the sea slug or sorry the sea cucumber that we saw earlier the red one uh that was a little weird looking um fun fact about them um their see-through so the thing that we saw that was a little spirally in their stomach was actually their poop and they poop out of their mouth which is really really weird uh not a fan of that <laughs> so i think they're kind of weird and freaky <laughs> Very, very cool. I will put this in the chat, uh, the banner for a second. Everybody should look up the barrel eye because it's the freakiest thing you will ever see in your life. Um, as soon as my computer wants to let me do this, I'll bring it up. But we'll head to Ms. Marco's class while I'm waiting to bring that up. If you guys want to come on in, uh, take us away, Monarchs. Hey. Okay, Leah, what's the question? Once the whale like, goes down and dies, do they ever like develop their skin like disappears. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the word that you're looking for is decompose. 
So that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, as soon as our bodies pass away, um, the whale's body begins breaking apart uh, and starts to decompose. Um, and then once it gets down there, it's going to continue to decompose. But those fish are pretty clever and they're pretty fast. Uh, they can kind of sense that the whale is there and they'll probably get to all the good bits before it's completely gone bad. Um, but even then, decomposers like worms and tiny little invertebrates will come and eat up even all the rotten parts. Um, so nothing will go to waste, uh, but it will always be kind of decomposing and di disintegrating. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, guys. I know it's the 40 minute mark, especially our grade 11s. You might need to go in a minute. So Mr. Duggan's class, I just want to highlight two things and I will email this to you as well. Uh, the BBC Blue Planet 2 Deep Sea episode is still the single best hour of natural history documentary ever. So if you want to follow up with deep sea stuff, that is an amazing resource. And the best channel for this by a huge margin, Natural World Facts has like 50 plus insane deep sea videos. If you want to follow up, they're targeted a little older than our youngest kids, but really, really great content if you want to follow up. Um, I will bring you guys in. I, you don't even need to flick on your mic, but Mr. Duggan's class, they wanted to know what's the deepest we found living creatures in the deep sea. Do we know the depth of oh, our I don't know the exact depth. That's a great question. I don't want to lie to you. Um, but I will say that um, we have barely explored any of the ocean. In fact, we know more about the moon than we know about our own oceans. Okay. So every time we do go into the deep sea, we are discovering new animals at different depths with really cool, unique adaptations. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact depth to tell you. Um, but every time we go in there, we are finding new incredible animals. We sure are. I can actually attest to the fact that we have found things on the Mariana Trench. So at the bottom of the ocean, there are living things, which is wild. I mean, the pressure is so outlandishly insane down there. I mean, it, it's like having 500 elephants stack on top of you. Humans could never survive. Nothing on the surface could survive. And there's fish quite happily down there. So it's very freaky. Um, <laughs> Mr. Hancock, I'm going to head to you guys. Time flies and you're having fun. We are nearing the end of the broadcast, but I will pass along resources via email to keep the learning going. Georgetown, though, kick us off. Perfect. Uh, so you mentioned about the angler fish being only the size of your fist. So some students were wondering, so do the sizes tend to be quite small for the things you find down there? Um, are the, the lifespans that much different? Are they living for a long time or very short amounts of time? What's the, some of the differences? These are beautiful questions and these are incredible questions. Jesse, I can see you're really excited about this question. Too, so maybe you can jump in and help me out as well. But it's actually incredible because in the deep sea, we have seen some of the smallest animals ever and some of the largest animals. In fact, deep sea giganticism is a real thing. We have the giant Pacific squid that lives down there. We have incredibly massive animals. One thing that they will all have in common most of the time is their really squishy jelly-like body, but the sizes can really, really compare and be very, very different from each other for sure. It's really just an adaptation. What's going to help that animal as a predator or as a prey really survive in that condition. Um, lifespans, I'm not exactly sure about. Maybe Jesse can jump in here. Um, Go ahead, Jesse, if you have any more information. Yeah. Some <laughs> creatures are known for having incredibly long lifespans. So some of the sharks that are on the very bottom of the ocean, we know can live uh, 80 plus, some of them 200 years. Like Greenland sharks are really deep. They're really long lived. Uh, one of the oldest uh, things in the world, that like a large animal. And as Mala was saying, big. Like some of you might be familiar with giant isopods. So like the roly poly bugs or, or sow bugs, different names for them. But they get to be like this big on the deep sea. Uh, Imagine like a potato bug, right? We yeah. call them potato bugs, but yep. like massive. Yeah. I mean, the big sharks down there, the sharks that eat whales are like 20 feet long. Like they're as big as great whites, but they live in the bottom. It's really freaky. It's a really unique place in the world. So I'm so glad we got that question, Mr. Hancock. Um, Mala, like it's the 44 minute mark. I know our classes have to run. Is there <laughs> any final message you want to share with our kids? Again, I'm going to bring up ocean.org, um, BBC's Deep Plan uh, Blue Planet 2 Deep Sea episode, Natural World Facts, some really amazing resources. I'll email you all of these. But is there any last message you want to share with our kids before I bring them in to say thank you and farewell? Yeah, as we all head out to continue with our days and continue through school, I want to urge you all to keep asking these amazing questions that you asked me today. Um, you guys have such incredible thoughts, incredible answers, and it's people like you that are going to come up with incredible solutions as well 
for our ocean. So stay curious. Maybe one day you might come across an incredible ocean animal and be able to bring that information to us. Uh, but stay curious and stay asking those questions. And maybe when you go home today, you can share three fun facts that you learned today uh, with your family, with your friends, anybody around you, so we can keep these con uh, conserva or, sorry, conversations going. <laughs> Well, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for your energy, your enthusiasm, amazing knowledge. This was a great journey. Also, the strangest whale diorama where he's about to sink I've ever seen. That was very fun for me. <laughs> um, we're going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Grisham Middle School, Michelle Burr's class, Mr. Hancock's class. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Georgetown, Iowa, Texas. <laughs> 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 <laughs>